Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted to be in the Aurora Borealis of creative experience here <laughs> with Steve Mitchell. Um, may I call you Steve? Is that okay? Uh, you can call me any, anything you want, but Steve's just fine. <laughs> all right. All right. Sounds great. Um, I'm, I'm struggling for a verb here. So filmmaker documentarian um comics creator what is it is creative just the verb that we use well yeah i think the ver the word you're looking for is mutt i'm just sort of a creative <laughs> mutt uh i started out uh wanting to have a career in comics which i did mm -hmm. uh, but while i was doing that at the same time i also was doing film journalism mm -hmm. uh back in the day i did it kind of as a hobby uh, it was an opportunity for me to get on all the screening lists in New York City. And, um, you know, I anybody who knows me knows me. I'm a movie guy and a TV guy and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, TV movie historian type of guy. And so I did that concurrent with my, my career in comics. And um, that kind of faded out because some of the magazines I worked for faded out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for that before me. But when I came to California, which somewhat coincidentally is 40 years ago, celebrating my 40th anniversary in L.A., um, that background, coupled with the fact that I'm nosy, uh, served me well once my comics career came to an end and I started working in DVD and Blu-ray special features, mm -hmm. you know, uh, doing commentaries and creating featurettes and stuff like that. In fact, one of the things you didn't call me was a commentarian because one of the other things I do is uh, as a film historian, I do uh, uh, Blu-ray commentaries and somewhere not too long ago, I crossed the hundred uh, yard line. I've done over a hundred. Now I don't do it all by myself because it's just too hard to talk for an hour and a half or an hour and a half is okay, but, uh, what if the movie's two hours or two hours and 20 minutes? It, it, mm -hmm. So I usually have a co-pilot uh, or two, but it's something that I really sort of put a whole lifetime of learning about movies, paying attention to movies, making movies. I'm also a screenwriter mm -hmm. um, and, and putting it to all, you know, some kind of observational use and, you know, just to sort of talk about movies, but not say, Oh, it's great. Oh, I like that star. I mean, part of it is is credentials, mm -hmm. but you know, one of the movie one of the movies that I did recently, I did a commentary for John Frankenheimer's The Train, mm -hmm. which is my favorite fl film of his today. Maybe tomorrow it's Ronan. I don't know, but they're both <laughs> fond of both of them. But one of the things that I like talking about was how he staged things, his yeah. choice of lenses, his his filmmaking thinking. Mm -hmm. So that that's a big deal but also i've done commentaries with people who have worked on material and it's just so great to get you know to get that on the record so uh i appreciate what you do and oh, well, kind you. of what i do yeah yeah absolutely and i think we have that in common that interest in film and comics and uh visual storytelling my dissertation was about teachers using film as a text so if you ever want a nice um sort of alternative to melatonin if you want something nice i, I can send you my <laughs> chapter three so you can read that before bed or something i mm -hmm. guarantee by page two uh it's like counting sheep it's great as, right. as a dissertation great. should be it's, yeah well you know <laughs> you say dissertation it has lots of implications true very true um so curious about thinking about that link between comics and film, do you see those as um, sort of existing in the same wheelhouse of, of media um, things in I, I common, think, things that are different? I think, I think the lines have gotten blurry since I got into comics, you know, Marv Wolfman, uh, I think, and maybe Len Wein and I a hundred years ago, we had some conversation about what, what great comics are. Mm -hmm. And I think we were thinking about that run of Fantastic Four, that run that was Lee, Kirby, and Sinnott. You know, Galactus was about ready to destroy the planet and all that stuff. And part of what made that a great comic book is that at the time, the only way to tell that story was to draw it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today, you could probably tell that story 
cinematically because there are a thousand people at workstations all over the world contributing to the visual effects. Um, but at the time, great comics were usually things that could not be, it, they were, it was a way to tell a story that could not be told in any other medium. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you think of what I think of anyway, the DC comics that I loved as a kid, I love big stuff, big yeah. aliens, big dinosaurs, big robots, big spaceships, egg foo with Wonder Woman, that giant freaking you know, Chinese egg villain, which I still don't get, but it was big. Mm -hmm. You know, Star Spangled War Stories, GIs versus dinosaurs. I mean, boy, that was in my sweet spot. You know, uh, Challengers of the Unknown, Suicide Squad. All of those things felt like movies to me, but they weren't paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So storytelling is storytelling, whether you're doing it as comics, animation, TV features, uh, documentaries. It's, it's all storytelling. And so we're all cousins, I think. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Suicide Squad and cinematically in my mind, I connect that immediately. It's, it's like Dirty Dozen with superheroes in my mind. Um, so they very much live in that space for me, too. Well, Challengers, the Unknown, Rip Hunter, Time Master, that's all stuff that could have been movies if movies could afford to do it mm -hmm. and had the technology to do it. Yeah, yeah. You could do that today. Yeah. The, the technology is there. And you mentioned those big images. So one of the kind of iconic images for a book that you've done, at least in my head, because it was a big Batman reader uh, and have been for a while, is Detective Comics 602, which has Batman sort of splayed out with like sort of this monster behind him, this like fearsome character kind Did of I ink that? setup. Did I, was, that a Bra was that a Bray Fogel story that yes, I inked? Yes, that was a Bray Fogel. Okay. And you were the okay. inker on that, yeah. Uh, forgive me, I forgot about it. But no, uh, no, not at all, not at all. You've worked on a lot of things. I didn't expect you to go. Oh yeah, six oh two. But yeah, just thinking about that. Every imagery. once in a while, that does happen. Um, you know, it's the the thing that I think people sometimes don't realize, and and this is true with people who work in television. You may have a favorite show or a favorite episode or a favorite moment. Mm -hmm. Well. That was one page of hundreds of pages that I inked of, yeah. of back, just with Bray Fogel. Yeah. Uh, that might have been one moment in five seasons worth of any TV show. I mean, I could go to Don Johnson and tell him my favorite piece of acting he did in Miami Vice, <laughs> and he might remember it. Chances are he doesn't remember it. Mm -hmm. But you know, these moments, what happens is these moments come to you as a fan or someone appreciates it. And it just, you know, it kind of stamps itself. It bakes itself in your, in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm not embarrassed now that I forget stuff uh, yeah. because, you know, I, I did a lot of comics. And I, uh, sadly, I've been out of comics for about 20 plus years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've moved on. Yeah. Yeah. I well, still the, like the creative well, I still form, by the way, I still like comics, but. All the comics I seem to like are the comics from my kidhood. Yes. You know, yeah. I still have fondness for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I too enjoy the, the comics from years ago. And um, so with that idea in mind of the moments you remember, uh, the things that stand out to you on the, the creating side, you've worked DC, Dark Horse, Marvel, um, a, a range of materials, Impact Comics, which was a DC sort of, subdivision for a while any i was kind of an upstart uh mm -hmm. bastard child um <laughs> but yes. work is work work is work and it was fun to read um any kind of mile marker any issue or collaboration that stands out that you just go to and you think man those well, were some it, good times the first mile marker for me was the first job i ever ranked which was marvel team up number four that was gil kane and i was mm -hmm. scared shitless by it um, it was very intimidating. I was trying, I, I was a lousy penciler, but I was a pretty good inker. I was pretty good with those tools. And so that's why my discipline was inking. And, you know, I'd done tons of samples and everything like that. And I never expected to get a Gil Kane job as my first job. Now, that was sort of my first and last job for quite a few years. They didn't like it at Marvel. A lot of people told me they they liked the job. Jim Shooter told me he liked the job once. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so, you know, history will bear it out. If you see the comic and you like the job, you like the job. But at the time, because I was young and there was kind of a little bit of reluctance to hire young guys unless they were insanely talented, uh, I was not. Um, I wound up staying in comics, but I wound up working in production. I also worked for Neil Adams at Continuity Associates Mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. And then about six or seven years after that job, seemed like forever, uh, I had a chance to start inking again. And uh, once I started, I kind of never stopped. So that was a touchstone. Other things that were touchstones for me, uh, Frank Miller's uh, famous Batman Christmas job, Santa Claus Dead or Alive. I remember going into the office, dropping something off, and Paul Levitt said, hey, you want to do this Batman job? He said, well, anything Batman I wanted to do. I love Batman. Mm -hmm. Character and artistically Batman stories were in my wheelhouse. I like stuff that had a lot of shadows, or as we call them in the business, black. Um, And there was always stuff to play with because Batman was always a character who lived in the shadows. Superman bored the shit out of me because Superman was a 12 noon daylight kind of thing. You know, Mm -hmm. it was just blasted with light, no artistic or dramatic opportunities. So Batman was perfect for me. So he get Paul get Paul Levitz gives me this Batman job penciled by a guy named Frank Miller. Uh huh. Uh huh. Hadn't heard of him. Had met him. Took it home. Had a great time. I really enjoyed it. Um, I just looked at it not too long ago. I would say that it's not bad. Um, there are things I would have done differently today, maybe at least up here. Um, but it was a fun thing to do, and then he became Frank Miller, and you know the rest is history. Mm-hmm. Um, when I sort of became the regular anchor in two different decades on Iron Man, I hate doing tech stuff. <laughs> right. I hate it. I loathe it. It it it's completely uh it's the opposite of what I like to do. Um, I like to do stuff which is expressionistic, um uh non non-metallic. Mm-hmm. Um, non-technical. I hate rulers. I hate French curves uh, of the, what do they call them with the circles and the ellipses? I don't know, templates. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I hated doing that stuff. It just wasn't who I was. I, when I was inking, when I was, I think at my best, I felt like a swordsman. I just go in there with that pen or that brush and I'm just whacking away at it and just, you know, thick to thin lines and trying to do it emotionally because that's kind of art I like. Mm -hmm. And yet that approach with Luke McDonnell and then later Kevin Hopgood seemed to work for Marvel because I had those two long runs on a book I totally never would have volunteered for. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in comics, I don't know if you've talked to other guys about this, there are jobs you take because you want them and there are jobs you take because you need to pay the rent Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make a living. And I think I was always one of them. And the other thing is you can say no every once in a while, but they don't like it when you say no. And if you say no, then sometimes you might not get a favorable. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to express it. They might not be as favorable to giving you a job you want. Mm-hmm. So part of it is you have to satisfy the needs of the machine. People forget that comics are a monthly grind. You are grinding out thousands of pages. Mm-hmm. Companies are grinding out thousands of pages every month. And to be, you know, to do what I did, I had to, I was part of the machine. And part of my job was to do good work, the best work I could do, but also to be easy to deal with, non flaky, mm-hmm. professional. Um, I used to work with a guy named Rick Magyar. He was a a guy who shared my studio, one of my studios, nicest guy in the world, talented guy. But every once in a while, he would just go away. Uh He just wasn't around. And and somebody from DC called me and said, have you seen Rick? You know, it's Uh it's the dependability factor. And, And this was, I think Rick went through this a couple of times. I don't want to dump on Rick. Great guy, great talent. But occasionally I think he got intimidated. Uh You know, when someone hands you 22 pages of pencils, you go, whoa, whoa." you know, it's not like a page or panel. It's 22 pages. And the only way to get through it on a monthly basis 
is one line at a time, one page at a time, you know, one book at a time. Mm -hmm. um, it's that's that's part of the craft of, of being a comics professional. And it applies to writers and pencilers, ink, uh, letterers and even colorists. Yeah. Yeah. Other other moments. Uh, oh, here's one other that I never forget. I always <laughs> I don't know, you know, when you when you when you say something often enough, chances are it might come true. One of the things I used to say is I one of my nightmares as an anchor was to have to ink an entire issue on vellum overlays over Xeroxes of pencils. Uh -huh. Well, Norm Brayfogle did was it, did one of the detectives was it six hundred? I don't know what it was, but it was one of these sort of you know major issues uh, uh, numer numerically speaking, mm -hmm. and. For some reason, that issue, the pencils vanished, and I had to <laughs> keep the entire issue on vellum overlays. Now, uh -huh. the idea of doing a vellum overlay on one page is enough, but to do a whole book on this very important issue, by the way, because I think there are a lot of Batman um, villains in it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That was kind of one of those nightmare jobs. And I think I did an okay job, um, but, you know... It taught me a lesson. Don't complain so loudly and so frequently. Things might happen. <laughs> was was that the uh, It's Blind Justice, I think, three of three? That was it, Detective it, Comics it, 600. It, it, uh, it might have been Detective 600. I, I don't really remember to tell you the truth, but it was just 22, 22 pages of vellum. You know, not my favorite thing to do, but it turned out okay. Yeah. yeah. Still never, no one ever found out what happened to those pencils, by the way. Oh goodness! <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about the intimidation factor, and then, um, I mean the the monthly grind you're talking about. I'm thinking about that from the editorial standpoint of trying to meet those dates, meet those mail outs, meet those. Oh yeah, all the parts of the production. Um, a month goes by really that. quickly. I encountered that too when I was working. Uh, when I started doing DVD special features that I always felt that was it Jerry Conway said to me once, he says, it's not good to be late, but if you're going to be late, it better be good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, if you can do something where maybe the extra couple of days makes a difference, mm -hmm. um, that's all that really matters. The work is what matters. But I found out when you're doing production line stuff outside of comics, as well as inside of comics, they don't like it when you're late. So that's there's that just that imposit that that pressure is put on you right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about that. Strangely enough, I was never the only time I was intimidated when I inked that Gil Kane job because it was Gil Kane for Christ's sake. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And to be on that first out the gate, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so you mentioned Marv Wolfman, Jerry Conway, Gil Kane. Curious about folks, and you, you could take this comics or film, comics and film, um, but folks that have been particularly positive sort of lighthouse voices along the way, positive collaborators. Well, Dick Giordano was my mentor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> he always used to give me a hard time because I was a foot taller than he was. <laughs> and he would always say, he says, yeah, you're taller, but I'm more talented. <laughs> and I think that's true. Um, Dick was a mentor to a lot of guys um, because Dick used to have assistants because Dick had to turn out so much work the pragmatics of it and I, I use background guys too that you get somebody who's it, it's like an apprenticeship because I did it as well where you know guys will come in and do background so they'll do you know props or something like that mm -hmm. and it's a way to sort of actually ink on paper on pencils. And it's a great thing to have as a, uh, as a, you just to get a feel for what the job is, you know, um, you look at the pencils, especially if it's by somebody you really respect and you go, oh, geez, right, you know, right. it's a little nervous making, but if you're used to working on pencils, it's just, it, it eases you into it. Even if you're just doing backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So Dick was an important mentor to me. Um, Denny O'Neill was uh, 
a co-worker, also an editor, somebody I knew socially who I liked a lot. He, he paid me the nicest compliment ever in comics or in life. Um, I'm famous for being a character in a Batman job by Neil Adams. Uh-huh. The, the Joker's five ways, something or other revenge, I think it is, where the Joker's running around killing guys who betrayed him. Uh-huh. And I was working at Continuity Associates one night, just, I think, doing some backgrounds. It was winter because it was dark. And it was only about six o'clock. And then Neil yells, Mitchell! And I, I practically jumped out of my skin because, I, you know, I, I, I figured, oh, I must have really screwed up something. Mm-hmm. And he says, don't move. And I go, why? And he goes, you're going to be bigger, Melvin. <laughs> this was a character that, that the Joker was trying to kill. And so I'm in about four or five pages of that story. Very nice. And Denny was being interviewed by, says, you know, I have the distinction of being in a Batman story and also being a a regular, an anchor regularly associated with the character. And then Denny said something to me, says, he said, Steve's an interesting guy because we used to have lunch a lot and we would talk movies and books and pop culture was almost a lot of times that had nothing to do with comics. And Denny was a very educated, very literate guy, but he also loved junk food. You know, <laughs> he, loved, he loved genre filmmaking and, you know, B pictures and stuff like that. I, I enjoyed his company a lot. And that was very nice. That, that was a nice compliment from him. I've never forgotten it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I'm going to have to go back and, and look for you in those issues. I think I've seen those. Yeah. It's, it's a really famous job by Neil. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was, yeah, I, <laughs> you know, there are a couple of shots. I look Asian, which is really strange, but, <laughs> um, you know, I had long hair in those days, like we all did, but right. it was interesting. That was a job that Neil inked himself. Neil rarely inked his stuff after a certain point because mm-hmm. everybody, every single person who sat behind, behind an editor's desk wanted Neil Adams to draw stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, when he first showed up, I don't know if you're if you go back that far, but he was the cover artist at DC and that there was that period in the 60s where he was doing, I don't know, half of the covers that they were doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they 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 I think if they could have chained him to the to the drawing board, <laughs> just fed him, they would have preferred that they gave him a free drawing board in their 909 Third Avenue offices, which is even then expensive midtown real estate. He didn't have to pay rent. He had a studio at the office at the office. He shared it with Murphy Anderson. And I think it was because basically someone could come in, Neil, I need a cover. Murphy, I need you to do a cover. I need you to do some Superman, you know, uh, revisions or something like that. So Neil was a very important guy. And so, but that issue, I said, yeah, well, how come Dick's not inking this? Dick would usually ink his stuff. Mm-hmm. But Neil did it, and it's a somewhat legendary job. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, wonderful company. Wonderful company to share about and to be in. Yeah, well, they were they were fun times. There, there were a lot of people there in comics who were my heroes, who mm-hmm. became my colleagues. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, one of the things that I talk about sometimes when I'm interviewed like this is I say. I never wanted to replace the guys who, whose work I read and I knew and I admired. I wanted to work next to those guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be part of their world. I didn't want to make their world my world. I want to be part of their world. Mm-hmm. And uh, recently I had an epiphany about my career, maybe because I have distance. I realized what well, I didn't want to be an artist. I wanted to be a professional. Mm hmm. I wanted to be a working guy in the business. Um, You know, yeah, I think I had some chops. I think some guys I was better with than others. But it was, I I just like the idea of being in the business, being a pro, working with my heroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, it was, it was heady stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, you do something for 20 some odd years and, you know, it's not so heady anymore. It's it's your job. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about you talking about being kind of a swordsman and, and laying <laughs> down the lines and uh, the brush. So I'm thinking I, I wonder if that translates 
to your work as a commentarian, documentarian. Um, well, is that a metaphor that carries? I don't know if it's a metaphor that carries, but um, so, some Mark Chiarello told me one day he said he thought I was an intellectual, and I said, "Oh, you know, get over yourself," <laughs> because I tend to react to things very emotionally, not intellectually. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I when I watch movies and or television, any form form of storytelling, I'm always thinking about how it was done, mm -hmm. what was done you know what the choices are um at, at one point uh i took i took an acting class just because it would you know if i was going to direct um i thought it might be helpful and you know one of the things that every creative discipline has is you, everything you do is a choice mm -hmm. yeah but you play a note on a guitar whether you use a color on a painting mm -hmm. uh What's the line width you use when you're inking a comic? Do you make it thick? Do you make it thin? Uh, when you're writing a screenplay, what do you put in? What don't you put in? Mm -hmm. Actors are making choices in every second. Mm -hmm. uh, directors are making choices. It's part of, I, you know, I, I was going to say the creative arts. Uh, that sounds pretentious to me. So I'm going to say it's part of the story, uh, the, the art of storytelling. And we're all storytellers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Mark Chiarello is one of my best friends, and, you know, I think he's an excellent colorist. And one of the things he does is when he colors, he chooses to use a minimal, minimal palette. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when he was coloring Hellboy with Mike Mignola, it was it was interesting. It was all kind of reds and warms and, and it was, you know, very simple. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you look at comics today where I think the colorist or the color artist has undue control of the page mm -hmm. because they're using digital effects, uh, airbrushing effects, uh, focal effects. They're, they're using all of these things that make the page theirs. Right. When I grew up, all of my teachers and mentors and everything I ever read that were Alex Toth was, you know, uh, proselytizing about comics mm -hmm. i was always told control the page use a lot of black use a lot of weight you know when you look at ec comics the great still in my mind might be the greatest comics ever done mm -hmm. you look at guys like severin and davis how the foreground figures would have a lot of detail and weight the midground figures a little less in the background were just almost just like simple lines but yeah. what you're doing is you're creating focus in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so how you would ink a page, how you would put weight on foreground figures versus mid and background figures, that was all storytelling. Yeah. And and but again, choices. My favorite guy to ink was Gene Colon. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. loved inking Gene Colon. Scared the shit out of me because Gene was worked expressionistically and tonally. So I have to, I had to make a decision in black, right? And and I'm going well. Whoa, 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 what do I do? Mm -hmm. And after I kind of got over that, I just I just really went with it because he used a lot of you know there's a lot of line work, there's a lot of mid tones, there's a lot of heavy blacks. There were choices that you made, and I love that. And that was that swordsman thing because I'm you know, just whacking away at it. It was just um, I'm making myself sound somewhat psychopathic in my work, but. <laughs> Or dedicated. <laughs> oh, well dedicated. It's metaphoric anyway, but it was just fun. And I think I, I, I've said before, I, if if at that point in my career, the only penciler that I would ink for the rest of my days in comics was Gene Cullen, my response would be, okay. Yeah. It was very satisfying. It was a lot of fun. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and I like guys like the guys who really work stuff out, you know, to a certain perfection of detail. I'm not the right guy. I'm just not the right guy. I, I just don't work that way. Um, you know, Terry Austin, who's a colleague who, you know, I knew back in the day, um, he did things that I could not do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He seemed to have the, the, the patience of almost like a Swiss watchmaker. <laughs> just the way he would sort of, his lines would define everything in a certain way. I, I was either impatient or bored. I just want to get in there just, 
whack at it. You know, like Joe Kubert's one of my favorite artists. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a great story. I've told it before, but it embarrasses me to this day, but in a good way. Years ago, when I first met Joe, I was maybe 16 or 15. I think I might have met him at a, on a tour or something. And I loved the DC War books. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They were like movies on paper. Right. And I said to Joe, I said, hey, Joe, you know, when you draw a Tommy gun or you're doing some, ref you know, some weapons or stuff, it's not it's always ac it's not accurate like Russ Heath or John Severin. And then he said very patiently and calmly and paternally, he says, well, Steve, it's because I draw them emotionally. Uh, uh -huh. Like someone hit me in the head with a frying pan. I mean, one, I felt like a complete idiot. But two, what a revelation. Because it said that's how Joe draws. Mm -hmm. And that's how, especially how Joe inks. You know, if you look at his work in the beginning, he was very influenced by Hal Foster at one time. The stuff was tighter. Mm -hmm. And then into the 60s and it way into the 70s, the stuff got a lot more. It, it was looser. And he was just, you could feel him just, just going whack, 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 whack with a brush. Mm -hmm. But man, emotionally, his nobody could top him. Yeah. Nobody. That and and so that was a great lesson. And I I wasn't trying to copy Joe's style because I don't think you could, but it just the idea of working emotionally was a big deal for me. So that goes to your other question about people who made a mm -hmm. impact on me. As far as that, that getting back to the, the beginning of the question, I, I think when I do my film work, when I do commentaries or the doc, you know, I've done uh, feature at work for DVD special features. I did a feature called King Cohen, which mm -hmm. was about Maverick director Larry Cohen, which was my first feature, and I'm doing one now about uh, actor uh, Wings Hauser. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm always looking for. I'm not looking for anecdotes. I'm looking for answers or 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 statements which reveal character. Mm -hmm. You know, which reveal who the person was like, you know, a lot of times you can see documentaries about special effects guys and, you know, analog era special effects guys. Well, you know, we used a certain kind of plastic and we blew it out with this blowtorch and and all of it is interesting, mm -hmm. but it's it's it, 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 it's a, it's it's an explanation of something, whereas. You know, if you can talk to somebody and get into their heart or mind about their work, mm -hmm. that is more interesting. Because I, I have this saying, I say, the most special effect of all for moviegoers or TV watchers, most special effect of all are character, character, character. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say that's an original thought. Um it, but it's a version of something Robert Kaniger said, I think, in a letter column. He was talking about Joe Kubert. You know, somebody said, who's your favorite comic book artist? He says, I'll tell you my three favorite comic book artists. Joe Kubert, Joe Kubert, and Joe Kubert. <laughs> because Kaniger, who was an interesting guy, I'll leave it at that, um, understood drama. Mm -hmm. And Kubert understood drama. And I think if I have any spillover from comics into my film work or my film historian work is drama is key. Emotion is key. Stories about <clears throat> like in my Larry Cohen documentary, you know, part of what was great about it was, is finding out <clears throat> how Larry was able to cheat mm -hmm. creatively you know, Larry, the producer, needed to save money, but what he did is he created an opportunity for Larry, the director, to do something maybe different or fun or nutty. Yeah, Larry was one of those guys who was, I think, motivated by money because Larry produced his own movies. But Larry, the producer, always did these kind of nutty uh, uh To save money, They he worked in an unconventional way. Mm -hmm. uh, he when he was first starting to make films in New York and Larry and I were very much like we grew up in New York, but we love living in Los Angeles. He had the opportunity to go back to New York and film there. So something I've always wanted to do and who knows. But what he did when he was first starting to do movies like Black Caesar and Hell Up in Harlem, he had two cabs. He would have one cab with with uh, uh, cast above the line talent, let's say. And then he had another cab that had crew and gear. And so they'd be, they'd be driving around and says, stop, let's shoot here. And they would 
actually get out of the cabs and sometimes grab these shots. And if you see my documentary, King Cohen, I sort of talk at, at more length about how he managed to get away with murder, escape mm -hmm. the unions, escape the cops. Um, but there was just this, you know, kind of by the seat of his pants approach to working, which I really admire because it was more inspiration than 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 just sitting around and trying to figure everything out like a lot of production managers and a lot of producers try to figure things out within an inch of their life and then larry mm -hmm. just didn't have any of that he was just going to say let's go out there and get it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i i admire that it's it's very it's 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 from the it's it's from below the waist let me put it to you that way yeah yeah T tying those ideas together in a, an emotional way of filmmaking yeah, and I think I think great movies are emotionally made. I think I'm going to soapbox for a second. I'm not crazy Final. about movies today um, because they're corporate. There are mm -hmm. a lot of decisions made by a lot of people, and a ton of people work on most movies today, not always in the same place. Mm -hmm. And while there is a certain kind of perfection in movies today, I don't care for most of them, especially superhero movies for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a reason for that. When I was growing up and I was becoming insane about movies, which was primarily in the 70s, I was watching movies before then, but I was really getting into them. I was reading all the time stuff about making films. I was really, this, this was something that fascinated me. Um, you could feel the fingerprints mm -hmm. of the director on a movie you could feel the fingerprints of even a screenwriter on on certain movies yeah. somebody once said to me about ray harryhausen the great stop motion animator he said yeah you look at harryhausen stuff and it looks a little creaky or antique here and there now because of technology but he said you can still feel ray's hands hmm. on the monsters on the creatures you can you can feel his personality going through his hands into the creatures when he's animating and and all these years later um you watch his movies and you go okay it's not state of the art but again there is that he imbues these creatures with persona and personality in a great way and as perfect as effects are today and they're amazing no question about it um perfection is kind of boring to me yeah. but I walk down my own street on this stuff. Well, and that, that gets to sort of auteur ideas about directors too, and how the the person's name directed by should have influenced the film in some way. And if it's indistinguishable from every other film in the series, then what's the point in having that person bring air quotes, their vision to it, if it's uh, just sort of mechanized through the corporate machine after that? Well, every director wants to have the credit of, uh, a, a, you know, a, a so-and-so film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you see the credit a film by, um, and that and and that director doesn't write the film, I kind of cry foul on that one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and Larry Cohen again, just because he's convenient. One of the things that you see at the end of every one of his features, the first card is a Larry Cohen film. And one of the things that I've, I've talked about endlessly is the fact that Larry earned that credit. He wrote, produced, and directed that picture. Mm -hmm. Like it? Okay, get, give Larry Cohen the credit. Hate it? Give Larry Cohen the credit. But Larry earned that credit. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody writes and produce, writes and directs, I think there's still authorship there. Mm -hmm. um, Strangely enough, the one guy who could get away with it, you know, John Carpenter always put his name above the title. Yeah. And he didn't always write his stuff. But there was kind of a zeitgeist to his films. Mm -hmm. We go, okay, this feels like a John Carpenter movie. It doesn't feel like anybody else. It feels like a John Carpenter movie. And this is true with guys like Coppola, uh, Spielberg to one degree or another, um, even though he didn't write most of his stuff, it still, his movies felt like Spielberg movies. Mm -hmm. Scorsese, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Nolan today. Mm -hmm. uh, love them or hate them, Christopher Nolan movies are Christopher Nolan movies. 
Um, Tarantino, of course, is maybe the great sort of auteur right now because there is no mistaking his work for any other director. Right. And But there are a lot of guys today who have a, an enormous amount of talent, but it doesn't seem to be personal talent. It's either technical or, a, you know, there's certain people I know who, who think that they can make a movie in their room because mm-hmm. of technology. And I always say, you yeah, know, what's the script going to be? Who's writing the script? Mm-hmm. So I'm a screenwriter and I'm prejudiced about that. And then, um, you know, who's going to, who's going to star in it? You know, I, I wrote, I co-wrote a movie in the late nineties called against the law, mm-hmm. which was a direct video movie. I did it with a guy named Bob Sheridan who passed away. And, um, one of the things about that movie was that it represented at the time my thinking about uh, heroes and, you know, I, it was, it was almost written as a reaction to Miami Vice. Mm-hmm. I love Miami Vice and Don Johnson probably killed a hundred guys on Miami Vice. Well, I wrote this one movie about a guy who killed, killed one guy for the first time and it was really screwing him up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the bad guy was uh, a narcissistic psychopath looking to, you know, become famous as this gunslinger who could take out cops. And, and he would always say, are you fast? And so you have a story about one bullet creates this whole kind of problem for the LAPD. And ultimately, this guy wants to face what he thinks is a hero because he's been on TV. So you're talking about media. You're talking about you're talking about uh, you know the, the, the price of violence. You're talking about all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a profound movie. I think it's pretty good. But, you know, you're talking about actors. This is where I was going with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to write a scene that I didn't want to write. You know, when they were giving me notes, they said, well, why does this character do this? Why does he drink? And I said, I hate exposition. By the way, Larry Cohen told me, he says, I hate exposition. He goes, I never explain any of my stuff. It just <laughs> happens. Yeah. That's why it's a Larry Cohen film, by the way. And, and I had to write that. Bob said to me, he said, I'll let you write this. And I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> and so I wrote this expository scene about why the protagonist has an issue with alcohol, <laughs> told by his ex-partner, who's the lieutenant. Long story less long, the guy who plays the lieutenant, Gerald Ford's son, Stephen Ford, uh-huh. gives a great performance. And it's the human factor because he took my scene, which I didn't want to write, but I still applied myself. And he took it and he tucked it under his arm like a football and ran right down the field into the end zone. And uh, I remember going to a screening with an actor friend of mine and he turned to me and he goes. (laughs) And and I learned a very valuable lesson that, you know, actors are so important. Yeah. Yeah. And and the human factor to any piece of storytelling is so important. Now, this is a little tiny story. OK, but think of any movie you've ever seen that resonates for you. I have this thing I, when I when I, I say, yeah, but was I was it still sticking to my forearms when I went to the parking lot? Mm-hmm. Great mm-hmm. Movies, they, they get on you and they stay on you for a while. Mm-hmm. And my problem with most movies today, in spite of the fact they're incredibly well made and I'm competent beyond belief technically i don't carry many of them out to the to the parking lot mm-hmm. with after i leave the theater and i think that's because the human factor is being kind of minimized to some degree now everybody who makes movies today is going to say oh no you're completely wrong right right i look at the work and that's my that my opinion is based on what i see yeah it's the impression that you get when you walk out of the theater that's the litmus test the viewer. Yeah, the, the second litmus test is would I buy it on Blu-ray? True, true. You know, would I <laughs> want to would, would I want to spend money and then revisit it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, same here. Same here, indeed. Um, so that brings us to the final question on my list. But we can certainly the final get question. The final countdown. Uh, is this the bonus round? This is the bonus round. I'm going to start bringing people out and asking you to recognize them. No, uh, what I'll do is if there's anything else that we've missed in the talk through that you want to make sure to share, you're certainly welcome to do that. 
but um, curious. Well, one, of the things, one of the things I do want to talk about is I have a podcast of my own called True Believers. Yes. And um, it kind of grew out of the fact that there's a documentary I would like to make about, um, you know, my generation, the blue jean generation, which was the first generation that, you know, first generation of fans that became pros mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, um, that we were part of, of something that in a tiny way changed comics when all of these young guys, these fanboys, and we, that wasn't even a term in those days. Mm -hmm. We kind of found our way into comics and, you know, a lot of guys more talented than me made, made a huge impression. Um, but we sort of developed a podcast, uh, which oftentimes it started out as kind of me having sort of uh, reflections of things that I, I watched and I saw and I experienced early in my career. And then I've started to expand it a little bit with, you know, co-pilots and we have themes and, you know, I don't do it as frequently as I should because I'm doing other things, but we've already probably got about 30, 35 hours Mm -hmm. worth of material up there so true believers podcast i think wherever podcasts can be found um it's you know there's some interesting stuff on that site i think wonderful wonderful that that was going to be my question of current creative pursuits um things that you want to mention as far as where people can go and um kind of check out your your work well uh right now my work is um i'm like i said i'm i'm making this documentary about uh actor uh, all right i'm going to hype it a little bit i'm not a good hyper by the way actor extraordinaire wings hauser uh, mm -hmm. and the reason i call him extraordinaire is he has done all kinds of stuff a list b list and c list and he's always interesting he's always good he never stinks mm -hmm doesn't matter what the material is that's not easy you know he was kind of a movie star for a while in the in the direct-to-video universe mm -hmm. uh, he had some demons he had to deal with he did a lot of television but he's had a career that's lasted close to 50 years and and he's the you know he's the one constant mm -hmm. and so we do we, do we have time to tell the sort of silly story about how it came yeah, to happen? By all means, yes. Okay. All right. It's So we, we have a movie night, my partners and I, my, my producing partners and I, like once a month. And one night we ran Vice Squad, which was the movie that Wings Hauser was sort of unleashed on the world. Mm -hmm. if, you see, if you see Vice Squad, which is quite good, Wings' debut in that is sort of parallel to Alan Rickman's debut in Die Hard. Oh wow! You, know, yeah. you walk away and you go, "Who is this guy?" Uh huh. Okay, and with and he had the great name. So we watched this movie with another friend of mine who's a writer producer, and he'd never seen it. And he said, "This guy's great." He said, "Yeah." He said, "We should watch some more stuff with him." And then COVID hit, mm -hmm. and so what we did is every Friday night for, oh, I I don't know how long, we would find something of Wings Hauser's. We would watch it separately and then get together via Zoom on Friday, generally with alcohol. Mm -hmm. We would mm -hmm. talk about the movie and we would just have a lot of laughs. It was a way to deal with COVID. Yeah. So we did this for at least a year. When, and my friend Cy, Cy Voris, who's a, an exec producer on my Wings Hauser documentary, working class actor, he said, you know, she said, this is ridiculous. He should know about this. <laughs> and she used to be an agent. And she knew somebody who was a like a casting guy who had a path to wings. Uh -huh. And so one Friday night we had a group a group call. We couldn't do. He's he's you know he knows less about technology than I do, uh, and I I don't think he could quite figure out the Zoom thing. But we had sort of this conference call in mm -hmm. essence, where he talked to. He was a little nervous, but he knew that we were in the business and stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah. We just started to talk and we talked for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes or whatever it was. And and he was great. He was fun. He had great anecdotes. He had great recall. He's a great storyteller. And my my partner, Matt Verboy, is quite always the entrepreneur, said, is there a movie in this guy? <laughs> and I said, I think I need to meet with him one more time. 
And so we met at the Manhattan Beach Studios during COVID. We had to get tested and all this stuff to get in. And then we met at this outside area that used that had been designated as a coffee, you know, a coffee house type thing in the studio. Mm-hmm. And we sat, we chatted with him for again another hour and a half. And then we, you know, got together was Matt, Matt Verboys, my other partner, Dan McKeon, and I, we sort of went out and I don't know, we got a pizza or something like that. And we said, I don't know, this this guy's pretty interesting. Mm. And what I liked about it was here was a guy and he gave us, he says, I'm an actor. I'm a working class actor. I immediately said that that's the title. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because a great title. you see documentaries about movie stars. You see doc, you know, like everybody's famous. Wings is known. Mm-hmm. He's especially known by genre fans, but he's not, he's like one of those guys that I think people will see his face and they go, Oh, him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's one of those, but what I'm trying to do is create a story about what it's like to be an actor, surviving your own personal demons, your ups and downs, having a career and, and hanging on to the career because the guy loves to act. Mm-hmm. You know, some people like to work. He loves to act, you know, he, and he's a big sports metaphor guy. And he says, listen, I want to be on the field. I want to be there for every play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I said, here's an opportunity to maybe tell a story about an actor talking about being an actor, but not like from the movie star standpoint. You know, I'm trying trying to get into his his heart and his head. And we we did about seven hours worth of uh, interviews with him. And now I'm working my way through, you know, the good news, too much good stuff. Let me see here. Put on the screen. I got this much good stuff. And then I got to kind of get it down to, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a great problem to have let me tell you but it yeah. it, it takes time but um i like and, and the reason i do this is well one i'm i'm the audience for it but i love talking about craft mm-hmm. when i was in comics and i could talk to my heroes what kind of pen nib do you use why did you make that choice why why that outline that's so maybe overly bold mm-hmm. uh Why did you just do a light rendering as opposed to, you know, like all all that, you know, kind of comic book pro stuff that I love that. I live for that. It's a way to learn. And, you know, when I started doing uh, special features, you know, it was okay. It was satisfying that way to learn thing. But on the movie side, I I was uh, a co-producer of the special features for the old combat TV series, which mm-hmm. I used to watch with my dad. Mm-hmm. And um, it's amazing. You know, getting, you know, coming full circle here, you know, about getting things on the record. Yeah. Yeah. Virtually everybody I talked to when I did those extras is gone. Wow. wow. And I did, I did two commentary tracks with Robert Altman. Mm-hmm. Robert Altman, because he directed <laughs> a bunch of episodes. Yeah. Now, in the beginning, I wasn't on the tracks verbally. They would cut me out because they wanted it to be like a monologue. Mm-hmm. And so I would just interview them, but I wasn't on the track. And then I think with season three, one of the editors said, you know, you have a, half, you have a decent voice. Why don't, do you mind being on the track? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, how do I justify it? You know, because if you're doing something, you know, you got to, you, why are you doing it, not somebody else? Mm-hmm. And then I came up with this thing where I said, like, hi, I'm Steve Mitchell, DVD special features producer for Combat Series 3, blah, blah, blah. And that was my way to validate who I was. Love it. The credentials. And then, you know, so that was just one of those in the moment decisions. But then the conversations, the commentary tracks were more conversational. They're, they weren't stilted. There, there was more give and take. And, man, I love doing that stuff. And that that's kind of what propelled me into this. You know, I was already interested in in movies and television. You know, everybody knows me, knows that I'm insane about it. But now it was a way to propel me into it uh, in a professional and creative way. Mm-hmm. And and again, with combat, and then I did something, you know, I did uh, a, a, a image, did a Thriller, the Boris Karloff mm-hmm. uh, hosted series from the 60s that people forget. I put together that set too and, and got a whole bunch of different guys to do commentaries. 
And it's just, man, just getting the stuff on the record, you feel like, okay, in a tiny way, I've contributed to some living history. And Sutton Rowley, Richard Donner, Michael Caffey, George Fennedy, all of those guys were great. But I got Robert Altman to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever gotten him to talk about that stuff. And I remember him telling me, and he, you know, he's a very kind of dry guy. And he, and he turned to me and says, you know, I don't think I would I direct these any differently today. Nice. So, wow. That, again, I love this stuff. And that's why I, that's why I do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that combat set lives in my parents' video collection as well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's there. Um, complete with your voice. It has my voice also. I, I put together a bunch of featurettes. The one I, I kind of enjoyed maybe the most was I did a thing called Directed by Vic Morrow, mm -hmm. where Vic Morrow was one of the directors on the series, and he directed the best episode of the series. But he went <laughs> he went uh, 10 days over schedule, mm -hmm. and he did nothing but, but antagonize the network. Uh, we talk about it, but I'll, give, I'll share one little thing, that he would get notes from the network saying, what is it going to be done? You're running late. And, and legend has it that he would use those notes. He would strike a match, light the note, and use the note to light his cigarettes. <laughs> uh, but yet, everybody who worked with him loved working with him. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so glad I was able to get that down because it, it, it kind of explains why he didn't have a bigger directing career. I think he got in his own way. It wasn't the talent. The talent was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm so glad I did that. You know, um, I'm glad I do everything that I do that that helps just sort of maybe add a little bit to the sort of this giant bully base of movie and TV information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was so glad I did Larry. I mean, Larry passed away a few years ago. Um, and I think the most gratifying part of doing it was we went to a number of festivals together and Larry got to be on stage and he could feel the heat from the lights mm -hmm. and, and that made him almost younger. And I kind of got out of the way and not make it about me. I just let it be about Larry because Larry, when I met him was, I think a little, I think he wasn't feeling great about the fact that he was maybe forgotten or he was feeling like maybe he was forgotten. And I and, and for me, the best part of doing it was I was able to get him in front of an audience mm -hmm. for him to have a curtain call. Yeah. Filmmakers don't have curtain calls. So I got I was able to give Larry a couple of curtain calls and I really I'm very happy about that. You oh, know. Yeah. And I miss Larry too. We used to argue all the time about stuff. I go over to his house, his wife would make the, the best, you know, uh, lattes and we would sit in the kitchen and, and argue like two new yorkers you know <laughs> no you're wrong no you're wrong no you're wrong if larry once said to me so if i wanted your opinion I, i'd ask for it and i said well you got it anyway he says yeah but you're wrong no i'm not you're wrong <laughs> and and his and his wife would just she was dying she she thought it was hysterical because mm -hmm. you know we're new yorkers yeah yeah. It's the fighting is in the DNA. So it was just it was a lot of fun sparring with him. And Larry was very knowledgeable about movies. Uh, again, he had that kind of, you know, before there was an IMDb, there would be guys like us who tried to remember all these credits. Mm -hmm. You know, you say, oh, yeah, Rod Taylor is in that movie or oh, yeah, that was shot by uh, Gordon Willis or Jerry Goldsmith did that score. You know, it's. Mm -hmm. You'd see the stuff and you'd have to remember it because there was no internet. There was right. no, so you had to be, you know, the IMDB. You'd listen for those horns and go, oh, that's Goldsmith. Uh, yeah. Well, Jerry's my favorite composer. Don't get me yeah. started. <laughs> I, you know, it's fun. It, it's just a quick sidebar. When we did the thriller uh, commentaries, I called up a film historian named John Burlingame and he's a film music historian, really an author. And I said, I'm doing this. It'd be great. You know, Jerry Goldsmith did music for, for Thriller and Morton Stevens, who is famous for Hawaii Five O, also did music for Thriller. So we did one Goldsmith together and one uh, uh, Morton Stevens. And at the end of a 45 minute phone call, John says, 
gee, I don't know if I have a whole lot to say. And I said, John, I wish I was recording this. We had all kinds of good stuff in here. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so we're going to record it. And I couldn't sleep the night before. I just couldn't. I, I had, you know, a stage fright or whatever it is, because I had nothing but enormous respect for John Burlingame. I've read a lot of his liner notes and stuff. <laughs> I go up to him in the morning we're doing, I say, yeah, I didn't sleep very well last night. I was just worried that I was going to hold up my end. And he just looked at me and said, don't be silly. <laughs> and we had a great time talking about Goldsmith and Stevens and how this was part of their evolution as composers working in television. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just... I love doing this stuff, whether I'm doing a commentary or an interview or I'm making a film or a featurette or anything like that. I love talking about this because here's the crazy part. There's a lot of stuff I remember from decades ago that I just take for granted. Mm -hmm. People know. Mm -hmm. I take for granted that people know what it was like when Star Wars opened up. I take it for granted that people know what it was like, you know, with the, you know, what Jaws opened up or The Exorcist or any great movie, The Godfather. Mm-hmm. You know, those were movies from the 70s that had such tremendous French connection, tremendous impact on me. And they don't. Right. A lot of people who, who you know, like the, with this podcast, you ask me questions about my comics history. And I just presume everybody knows what I know because I know it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's not the case. So you have to remember that people don't know what you know and 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 try and at least context your answers or your thinking or your writing or your talking or your gabbing with that context. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of commentaries, I say, at the time, this movie made this kind of impact. At the time, these critics were hot and cold on something. You know, at the time... People were standing in the rain around the block from the theater to go see, and I did this myself, The Godfather. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I remember standing in the rain on a weekday night trying to go see the 10 o'clock show of The Godfather on Broadway. Wow. It was a thing. This, is, this was part of that pop culture zeitgeist thing. And I realized, yeah, I got to share that because people don't know that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, because it's it's part of American pop culture. The impact that movies had at the time where people would stand on line in the rain or in the cold or in the heat mm-hmm. because it was important to see that movie as fast, as quickly as possible. And one of the things that's great about the old days is people would talk about it. There was this discourse, you know, you would go to the office Mm-hmm. whatever your office was. And I said, hey, I saw Jaws this weekend. Hey, I saw Godfather for the third time this weekend. Whatever. And people would interact. And now we live in an age where there's tremendous information, unbelievable information that's at our fingertips. But people don't interact about it as much as they used to. And I think that that, that makes me personally sad. Yeah. I. I had lunch today with Mark Chiarello and my my oldest friend in the world, Gary Girani, who's also a screenwriter, historian, commentary uh, guy. And, you know, we sat there for a better part of two hours just talking about TV and movies and comics and all this stuff that matters to us. New York, we're all expatriate New Yorkers. Um, I don't know if people do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's weird to me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, that's part of the beauty of sharing a story is you want to talk about it. You were talking about having the the feelings of something kind of clinging to you. You also want to talk about it. You want to tell people about it and go, hey, can you believe when they did this? Did you catch when oh, they yeah. put that there? And then oh, there are always the great fights. I, my, my favorite one for me was uh, when 1941 came out, Spielberg's 1941. I loved it. I thought it was nuts, but I loved it. But I saw it in New York, and for some reason, New York audiences hated it or weren't crazy yeah. about it. Then I moved to California. I said everybody out in California loved it. <laughs> and you go, well, that's an interesting kind of mm-hmm. schism. I think that's the right word. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That that geographically, wherever, wherever you are geographically, had some impact on what you might have thought of the movie. Yeah. That stuff doesn't really seem to happen anymore. And I'm again, it, it, I, I think we're a little worse off for it. Yeah, 
I, I agree. Maybe you have an opinion these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And something True. that uh, generates some positive conversation. I feel like there are lots of opinions, but most of them exist somewhere on Facebook and they just kind of energize people to no good purpose. I think that's a whole nother podcast, but I, <laughs> I just, I like talking to people in the moment about mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking pop culture, but it goes on to other things as well. I, I just think human beings sharing thoughts and experiences and feelings has value. Mm -hmm. And I think it has value, you know, in, in our pop culture, it has value in writing, you know, um, a lot of times you see things, come on, guys, let's go. We got to save this. We got to, that's not, it's, it's a form of writing, but it's not real writing. You know, mm -hmm. it's not subtext. It's not heartfelt. You know, um, I think one of the things that's unfortunate is that movies today are either blockbuster tent poles or they're indies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm a middle kind of guy. I like movies that were in the middle. I like studio pictures that had weight, you know, um, I'm not saying I don't like big budget pictures or, or indies, but for some reason they have their own turf. Mm -hmm. And I used to like that turf in the middle. You know, I love the eighties because there were studios that didn't have libraries of titles. So they had to make their own pictures and they were making these medium budget pictures like Orion pictures. Mm, I remember that. Tri star. Uh, some of the direct-to-video um, companies. Um, and because there were ways to monetize that. Uh -huh. you, know, you could make a movie that wasn't making a fortune at the theater, but you had home video, you had uh, pay cable, you had uh, sometimes network broadcast, you had syndication, you, know, you had VHS tapes. You know, um, just to brag a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm the co-writer of Chopping Mall, which is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a somewhat notorious, cheesy cult classic. Um, not me saying it; everybody else has said it to me. And I'll tell you, it's this is how it happened, and this and it doesn't happen like this anymore. My buddy Jim Winorski calls me up and he says Julie Corman has an opportunity to make a movie for Vestron Video. They, Vestron wants to do a movie about kids being chased around a, a shopping mall, you know, presumably with a guy with a knife. Mm -hmm. So I say, all right, let's get together and see what we can whip up. So we go to a place out here and we get pie and coffee and we sit there for a couple of hours and we whip up this kind of phantom of the mall story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it kind of worked. And then Jim said, why don't we try and do it with killer robots? And, you know, there was like, you know, I was like wide eyed and kind of uh, I, I speechless. And I said, OK. And then we reworked the whole thing and we came up with some sort of beat sheet outline, some synopsis. It was just kind of a mess. And we delivered it the next day and they sent it to Vestron Video. Hmm. And in a week, Vestron said, make it. We had a go picture, a go picture without a script, <laughs> just based on the idea. Jim and I wrote the script. Uh, we cast it. Um, we bumped into a guy going to lunch who created the robots. I did a sketch of one of the robots, which was not nearly as good as what they came up with, but it was a place to start. And everything just kind of happened quickly. We got this cast that turned out to be great. Um, the robots were great. The, the guy who composed the score had never done a score before. You know, there were all these moments, like, remember, with, with the shark the, the shark and Jaws. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It never worked. And <laughs> we never stopped to think, what if the robots don't work? Because they were all analog. They were ra ro radio-controlled robots. And they worked fine. But what if they didn't? We would have been screwed. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and when we were going over to the composer... It was a Sunday morning. The guy was a friend of ours. And I, I had a thought. I didn't I didn't share it with Jim. But I'm going, what if it stinks? What if it stinks? We Corman doesn't hire other composers. They go with who they have. Mm -hmm. 
And then I heard like three notes or something like that. And I said, Matt, we're in great shape. <laughs> awesome. Everything worked. Everything worked. And I love that seat of the pants approach. That's why uh, that's why I had such feeling for Larry Cohen, because it was such seat of the pants. Mm-hmm. I just like, you know, people get put in these situations and they got to do it. Right. Right. And and today there's so much thinking about doing it. No, don't think about it. Do it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Larry told me this story. He says he hated meetings, modern era meetings, because I go in the, he'd say, I go into these, these <laughs> conference rooms and there'd be nine people sitting around. They had legal pads and pens and everything. He just want to go in there and say, I want to do a movie about whatever. And in the old days, he would go pitch something. Mm-hmm. They said, okay. When he was writing television, he says, yeah, I want to do a story about this. And they said, go do it. Dan Curtis, who I just saw a bunch of these featurettes recently, was telling me about how he worked. It was the same thing as Larry Cohen. He said he would go in and see a network president and say, I want to do a TV movie or a movie about blah, blah. And they say, yeah, it sounds good. Larry, go do it. Uh, no, not Larry. Dan, go do it. Mm-hmm. God, I miss those days. <laughs> I really do. Lots, lots of meetings about meetings these days meetings kinda, about yeah meetings. yeah kind of yeah uh and speaking of let us schedule another meeting especially uh, hopefully, hopefully i didn't bore the crap out of you no no you were good i i'm curious about the um documentary and i would love to talk about that again sometime um so please I- i'll be following on facebook and other places but keep me updated i would love to continue i, having I would a say this Give me, uh, get in touch with me somewhere around the beginning of the year. We're cutting now. Um, I think we'll certainly have a, a rough cut soonish. Mm-hmm. But, you know, around the beginning of the year, we may want to start promoting it. Um, I don't know. We may even do a Kickstarter or something like that to get a little extra finishing funds. You know, yeah, that, love to, love that's, how these things, that's how these things get made. And, um so just if I don't reach out or something like that, feel free to nudge me. Okay. I will do that. I will All right. That. I would love and, to. And, and, you know, and just sort of talk about, you know, our, our, uh, our podcast, which I, I should be doing, you know, like one a week or two a month or something, but not always the case, but <laughs> you're a busy but they're, guy. They're always interesting. That's the thing that, you know, most of what we do with the podcast is through my filter of having been there. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people talk about things from an intellectual side or from a work result side. I was there. Most of what we talk about has my personal slant on it. Love it. Which I think, which it's, I think it separates it, you know, in, in a certain way.